I'm in the rainforest, specifically, this is the Amazon in Peru, and it is a hotbed of biodiversity, I mean, at least currently, but there are thousands upon thousands of species. And even if you ignore the fun ones, like the jaguars and the monkeys and the caimans, if you just focus in on moths, there are thousands of species of moths in the rainforest. And they're just the ones we know of. What about all the ones we don't know of? Well, that's exactly why I'm here. We're gonna use mathematics to both predict the existence of species of moths that no humans have ever seen before, and we're gonna use some maths to find a new species of moth. But not up here, I have to get down from the, down from the tree. This is actually happening. I am here at the Tambo Pata Research Center, which is in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. We are a long way from civilization. And here they do a lot of conservation work, a big part of which is documenting and tracking the various populations of the species that live in the rainforest. And a particular focus for this research center is moths. I'm so excited. So they are trying to work out all the different species of moths that are in this region. So every night they go out and try and sample them and they're constantly on the lookout for new species. And the very important thing, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this, if you discover a new species of moth, it's named after you. So if I find a new moth, it's gonna be the Parker moth. Come on, stand up moths. Who knows what we're allowed to call it? Okay, but this is what we're gonna do, very importantly. Uh, number two, we're gonna look at the mathematics and statistics required to predict how many species are yet to be documented, which I think is incredible that you can predict the existence of a species using mathematics that no human has ever seen. Number zero, I'm going to get out of the rain. This whole rainforest bit starting to run its course. And number one, we're going to go look for a new species of moth. I'm going to get out there and give it a go, but that doesn't work during the daytime. This is a terrible time for moth hunting. We need to wait for the nighttime and then nighttime. It cuts, me sh uh, uh, it cuts me shouting night. Night time! A couple of hours ago, they put this light on, and at the same time every night after dinner, anyone who's staying at the center can come out and try and find a new species of moth. And there are definitely a lot to choose from. So Issa here is gonna give me a hand. We're gonna get a moth. We're gonna put it in this magical jar. We don't discuss what happens after it goes in the jar. Um, and then we find out if it's a new species. So what would you, I mean, which of these are standing out to you? Yeah. I would recommend this one. This is an apatheloid moth, yep. and that's another one of the groups besides tiger moths oh. that we're interested in capturing. Okay. Right here. Got it. Here. There it is. Same one, but closer. Got it. Nice. And one went right down my sleeve. I'm going to very calmly give that to you, All right. and then go have a little panic over here. We spent a lot longer there that night, looking at moths, catching moths, being smothered by moths, being smothered, if you will, until at last it was time to pack it in, go inside, and wait for very early the next morning when we reconvened to see what we had caught. It's the next morning. Uh, he's got all the jars. We've just emptied the first one of my jars onto, this is particularly smooth paper. Yeah. To not damage the moths? Yeah. Excellent. We're going to have a look at them. If they're interesting, they get to go in a grid on this sheet. I'm optimistic. Once these are carefully lined up on the piece of paper, we'll then take a photograph of them, and that gets sent off to an expert at a university. We'll have a look at them and request. They ask for ones to be sent to them? Yeah, so basically, um, Juan Grados, he works at the Museum of Science in Lima, Got of it. Natural Science, and basically, um, a lot of them will be sent to him as samples for the collection in the museum. Right. And it's one of the largest collections in Peru and oh. the largest of tiger moths in Peru. Oh, amazing. And then ones that he thinks could potentially be a new species or that he needs to extract DNA from, we put into a jar, one of their legs into a jar with alcohol, and that goes off to the University of Guelph in Canada All for, right. for DNA barcoding. Oh, so they'll take one leg's enough yeah. and they'll get the DNA yeah. sequence if it's a new moth. Yeah, and the wow. alcohol absorbs the DNA. Oh, so when it gets there, it's just like an alcoholic yeah. DNA cocktail. As we were sorting, Head of Moths, Gabriel, stopped by to see if any of the ones from my jar looked the new to them. That brown edge, right. that, that one with and that this, is, this has got the extra stripe coming up the middle there. Yep. That could be my moth. That could be your moth. 
You remember the number of your jar? This is mine. That Excellent. Could, that could be the lucky one. That's great. You didn't even know which one was mine. And you <laughs> picked my moth. That's the stand-up moth. Issa is now sorting all the other jars of moth that are away. They're bothering. Obviously, my jars are going to have the new species in it. And we'll hear back before long if one of them might be brand new to humankind. We'll put a leg in one of these, post it off to Canada for DNA analysis. But I'm starting to wonder, um, given how many, how many moths we saw just last night, how long have we been doing this for? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. They've been doing this for seven years. I'm, I'm curious what my chances actually are of finding a new species. First up was to have a chat with Gabriel uh, about moths and how you go about discovering them. My name is Gabriel Serrano. I'm one of the resident researchers here. I'm a biologist and I'm in charge of keep, uh, running the three main projects that White Amazon have. I think the tiger moths is one of the most biodiverse groups if we are talking about moths. There's like 80 different group of moths and the tiger moths is just one of them. That's why it's necessary to have a lot of specialists to identify a lot of the different groups. I think I can recognize around 200 or maybe 250 different species of moths. So far I know that I collect four new species, but we need another specimen to be sure and start writing the paper about that one. So one of these uh, specimens is going to be to take micro photographies of the inner organs and also the genitalia of the, of the moths. That's why we need a second uh, specimen to be put it in the museum so other scientists can come to the museum and also check that specimen. We have one, one very rare tiger moth that have completely clear wings. It's not without scale, it's just completely uh, clear. And I see that just one time the last year. Most of the people think that the only pollinators are the butterflies and the bees. But since there's only six groups of butterflies and 80 of moths, so the hardest job have the moths. Yes, moths are important because they are key pollinators, more important than those showy butterflies. And I was surprised to realize that to document an official new species, you had to catch it twice. I was struggling with once, but I was starting to wonder what are my actual chances of discovering a new species, which means it's time to do some maths on some hypothetical creatures of our own creation. So imagine you come across an all new novel habitat and you think, what new species, possibly hilarious maths ones, are living here? So you set a camera trap to see if you can document any new creatures. And sure enough, on the first night, what's this? It's a ring-tailed ring. That's great. First night, new species. We are off to a racing start. On the second night, you set your camera trap and you get this. It's a hook-billed hexagon which is either learning to fly or is just bad at flying. Whatever the case, it's an all new species. Two nights, two new species. Incredible. Third night, oh, it's, it's another ring-tailed ring. That's fine. They can't all be winners. We're going to get some repeats. Fourth night, what do we got? Oh, look at that. It's a rainbow-footed rhombus. We managed to spot. Oh, it spotted us. I hope it's friendly. It looks friendly. Yeah, it's friendly. So... To recap, we've been looking for four nights, we've found four different individuals, and they give us three new species, which is great. But then on the fifth night, we get another ring-tailed ring. Okay, day six, ring-tailed ring, day seven, another rainbow-footed rhombus. We're not getting anything new, but then, look at this! It's a 20-eyed trapezium that's playing basketball. Yeah, that makes sense, why not? Day nine, we got species four, but then, for ages, nothing! It's just like more of the same over and over it takes until day 30 when we get our next new species let's see what it is oh it's a teal winged triangle look at it fly oh that's way more majestic than the hexagon mark that down and then we're back to capturing species we've seen before so the question now is have we found them more or are there more out there so let's have a look at a plot of how many species we've found over time. To start with, if we look at the first four we found over nine nights, it looks like the curve is... It, it, does that count as flattening out or is it still going up? In fact, if we bring in when we found the next one on night 30, now we can start to ask ourselves, does that look like it's flattening out? Or we can predict way into the future and we can try and have a guess where this curve is going to go. Eventually, we will find all the species and it will flatten out and mathematically we can try and predict the shape of this curve it's going to start going up very quickly and then it's going to flatten out however now we've arrived in assumption town and there are lots of new assumptions 
to discover here about the different size of the populations, how often they come out, how many we're catching at a time, because we've been just looking at one individual at a time. This is often called a rarefaction curve, because what biologists can do, if you're capturing multiple animals at once in different sample sizes on different nights, you can use software to randomly select a subsection from them to kind of even out the biases of the different sample sizes. And so you can then do this plot, either in terms of number of individuals you've come across or number of times you've sampled. So we would need to work out for our situation exactly what shape curve we expect, and then we can work out with what level of certainty we anticipate we've discovered what percentage of possible species. And it's gonna get difficult towards the end. It looks pretty flat in our case, unbelievably. On night 100, check it out. It's a orange spotted octagon. No wonder we missed that, it's tiny. Tiny but wonderful. We can now add that to our plot. We can update our model. And once again, we can try and work out how many species are left out there. Moths are not the only game in town. I also had a chat with a researcher named Mark from the University of Suffolk, who's actually the person who invited me out to the rainforest in the first place. And they study some different creatures. And you actually use rarefaction curves in your research, which is not moths. No, no, I'm far fewer species. Right. Um, I work with mammals, so um, I can go up to 20 or 30 large mammals. Oh, which, mammals are, you, which mammals are you researching? Uh, so where we've used rarefaction before is in surveying the canopy. Uh, we used to study primates by walking transects, yep. uh, but we wanted to switch to cameras in the canopy. Okay. It, so we could get nocturnal species and diurnal species. But when you change a method, you need to compare the methods to find out which, which one's working best and which is most efficient. Um, Cause you're gonna spend money on it at the yep. end of the day. Uh, so we plotted curves um, for the accumulation of mammal species with the camera traps and curves while walking transects. See how many kilometers versus how many trees we have to climb. Got it. And Compared them. To see which is best. You're working out what's the most efficient way to log all the species that are around. A exactly. Um, I then said to Mark, could you take the rarefaction curves you're using with mammals in the canopy and apply it to the moths? Because this is mathematics. And I wanted to know what my chances are of finding a new species. And first of all, you had to log all 178 of the currently known tiger moth species and you're only specifically doing tiger moths because that's what you've got the expert in and so you sat down and worked out this is incredible and some of these didn't exist you know, th this is these are just the moths that we're getting at trc in two and a half months so yeah other t other this, months there'll be many more species as well so this is specific to this time of year yeah at that location yeah ones that are attracted to light and are nocturnal yes. and you've got 178 just tiger moths alone and you had to go through and work out what all the all the informal names you've been using for these. Yep. Then you have to go through and get estimations for how many of each of these you see. Because as we saw, there are too many moths to count every single moth of every single type. So you put some rough numbers on this. Yep. And you put them into a rarefaction curve. Yep. And we got these. So um, what are we looking at here? Okay, so you've got species diversity up there. Yep. Side and... Um, as you get more and more species, you add them to the curve. Okay. Right. Um, but this is done uh, several times, um, and they take an average. The yep. program takes an average, so we have some error. error That's bars, error there yep. as well. Okay, so there's like, the, there's like the, the funnel and the most likely path through the center of it. And yep. that's where we are now. Yeah. And then well, this one is abundant as opposed to occurrence. Okay, yeah, so, so this is um, based on the number of sample nights. Got it. And this one's based on the number of sample individuals. So, so this one tells you how many more moths you would have to find before you before you found species. all the species. Um, and this one, how many nights you would have to sample. These are looking real flat at the end there. And the completeness rating is 0 0.9947 and 0 0.9983. Yeah. So, so what, what the difference between the, these curves and the ones I get with mammals is that you've actually got quite a complete sample there, um, right. nearly complete, but actually they're not flat, suggesting to me you're going to have to sample a very long time to, to get, get those new species. But this is also assuming that the, this, there's some assumptions about the number of individuals per new species, because talking to the moth people, they're finding them a bit faster than this, because this would indicate there's like one species left. Yeah, so I think 
these curves, are, they make some assumptions. So they're yep. assuming that your conditions are similar, your season's not changing. Got it. Um, but actually, you've got rainy days, hot days, friahi days that you found out about when it gets a bit cold. Oh my goodness. Um, and the season's constantly changing. The habitats are changing too. Right. Um, and, the, and I think the key is, in that sample, those rare species, they're specialists. So they're living in different parts of the forest. The forest is always changing. You might get a tree fall, you've got a clearing, that's a microhabitat forming it. right next to the trap right there. So and it, it would change because of that. Oh. So, so if I wanted to really find a new species, I'd have to look somewhere different that's not all these. You need to find yourself a, a new environment, new location, new method maybe, give yourself a better chance. Okay, we can do that. To increase our chances of finding the yet undiscovered species of Matthew Parker, we decided to change everything. Instead of looking at night for nocturnal moths, we're going to look in the day. Instead of using light to attract them, we're going to use a special plant that produces a smell that moths like. And instead of looking in a clearing on the rainforest floor, we're going to go up to the canopy. Initially, we tried hoisting the moth attracting plant to a tree at the very top of the canopy, but that was fraught with all manner of problems. So we very quickly abandoned that idea. On site, there was a viewing tower, a terrifying distance off the ground. So you can see across the rainforest canopy and we put some of the plant up there, left it for a while and went back to check. I actually got there first, clambered all the way to the top and saw a surprising number of moths. We were soon joined by a resident moth expert and we collected as many of the ones which appeared to be new to science as possible. There were so many, after a while, we ran out of space to keep them in the container. I had to chug the remaining water in my water bottle so we could then use it to collect moths. We did ask the moth experts about this moth on my arm and they said that the photos and video we got is not good enough to be conclusive, but potentially that's a moth never seen before by humans. Science is unaware of it and landed on my arm. We had a wonderful time together. It left never to be seen again. Confirming a new species is a long, difficult, slow, tedious process and I've been back from the Amazon for a few months now and I've only just heard today that my candidate moth from the light trap has been recognized by an expert as a pre-known species so oh well I mean I still have all the ones from the tower we haven't heard about those yet but I thought I'll put the video out now and if I hear anything about the moths from the tower I'll give you an update to let you know if any of them were new to science. And of course, I was not out in the Peruvian rainforest just to look for moths. That was the highlight, obviously. And huge thanks to the rainforest expedition folks who organized our travel and our accommodation and managed to get us to the research center. And they're not sponsoring the video, but I have put a link below if you'd also like to go and visit the rainforest. I have to warn you though, you were very, very in the rainforest, and I, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but just know you're going to get real rainforesty. And while I was there, I was able to check out the other conservation work that they're doing, partly funded by the tourism side. And an aspect of that involved climbing up a very, very large tree with Mark. And there's not a natural climber, it was a bit of a challenge. However, it was totally worth it because it turns out moths are not the only creatures which we need to keep tabs on. There are a lot of other animals in the rainforest that we have to count. So right now, Mark and I are up in the canopy. We're about 30 meters off the ground because this is one of, this is like an artificial macaw nest. And the idea is they're able to nest in this because the trees they normally nest in are being cut down. And uh, obviously you want to know if this is working. So what I thought I'd do, we're going to start with macaw. I'm going to name a bunch of animals and Mark is going to say how we count them. Macaws. Uh, point count. Point, what's a point count? Uh, you stand, point at it and you count, no, right. You stand on a point. Oh! A certain amount of time you, you count all the birds of all the species you're interested in as they go past. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, what about monkeys? That's your speciality. Yeah. Uh, still line transects, if you actually want to know how many transects. there are. Yeah, old school. Walk through the forest, count them either side of the line, measure the distance to the, to the animal when you so see So you pick a specific direction? Um, you cut a trail. You cut a trail. Oh, right, okay, right. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, what about caimans? These, these are like the happy looking crocodiles. So that's a, a, a count along the river with a yep. spotlight at night. Oh, you just literally, there's one. There's you see one. the eyes shining, yeah. Some and people say they can identify the species from the color of the eye. That's incredible. 
uh, anteaters. Uh, that would be uh, the giant anteater yep. on the ground oh. with a camera trap, yes. a boreal anteater, uh, line transects, maybe camera traps in trees. Okay, sloth. Camera traps in trees. The only way, I think. You put your, so the camera trap is where there's a camera with a motion sensor on it. And then you just look at the footage afterwards. Um, what about moths? We've seen uh, mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> number of slaps. <laughs> slaps per minute. So many. Uh, and bush dogs. Probably impossible. Impossible. And in fact, all of these, you've got to then take what you've counted and extrapolate up to a whole population, right? Yeah, we've got... Uh, but use some tricks to account for imperfect detection. Yep. Um, and it's always a, an estimate. There's always some error in there. There's always error bars. But the point is, we can't conserve things, or at least track impacts on populations we'd like to conserve, unless we have some data. So whatever data we can get is better than nothing. But the better it is, the better it is. And if you were wondering how I ended up in this tree, we'll put a video on the second channel that shows Mark and I climbing all the way up. And while we're up here, we did some extra maths. You're going to enjoy it. Oh, and check out Mark's channel. If you like ecology, you should be subscribed to Mark.